The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. So here's an example. If we take that, if we take that cycle and we kind of unravel it over time, so we imagine what happens with each iteration, then these are some of the steps that you'll be going through typically. When you start with your project, um, you start with a, a maybe a design phase where you brainstorm different. You, you have a general idea of what your project is, is going to be about. You pick the topic. Um, you, maybe your, your your company decided to develop a certain product uh, for a com for a client, and uh, you start with brainstorming different representations of what the system could look like. Um, you pick a representation. You rough out the interface style very very uh, very generally, and um, the typical implementations here would be low fidelity paper prototypes, like a sketch on paper, with you know, pencil and, 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 and pen. And then your analysis and your redesign would be maybe walking through your design with the user maybe, with your client, um, and redesigning it based on their feedback, you know, rethinking the interface on very broad terms. You haven't written a single line of code, you haven't you know, dragged a single button into some interface builder, nothing of that has happened yet. Then as you go, um, you work with medium fidelity prototypes, which could be um, screenshot prototypes, for example, or um, very simple software prototypes. And those then will um, be fine-tuned, uh, you know, will you you'll start fine-tuning the interface, um, work on your screen design, think about the layout of each, each screen, if, if it is a graphical interface at all, because it could also be like a, I don't know, voice uh, command interface, so you don't have any screens to design. Um, you do things like heuristic evaluation, and I'll explain what that is. Um, in, in a few uh, classes, and um, you redesign, you redesign, so you go through more of these iterations. And then as you get towards the end, and you're basically settled on everything, but you still need to work out the little kinks, you know, like the little things that aren't quite right, then you are working with high fidelity prototypes, basically something that leads to your, towards your working system that's already maybe implemented in the final language and, and environment that you want to build your code in. Um, and then you do things that, like the classic usability testing, right? You give your system to, you know, I don't know, 50 users and you get feedback from them in a, in a setting, in a lab setting, or you run field studies, or you release a public beta um, um, later on, like alpha and beta tests. Um, and then you basically get to the working system. And if we say project end here, then that's basically just suggesting that you know, you've got your first release out. Of course, things continue even afterwards, right? Your system's out. If you do app design today, um, there is no end of your project, right? I mean, you basically your first release that goes out on, on, on to the app stores is almost more like the start of your project, really, because you continuously have to change and update um, your code, and and it's so easy to feed updates to your user base and to to distribute it that that's become a very viable way of working. So it means that this will continue. So you will continue doing more readability testing, redesign, field tests. And then you will continue releasing version, you know, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, etc. Okay. In uh, Norman's book, he also talks about this iterative cycle. So you'll find many different names for this iteration uh, process, this iterative process in the literature. Um, we call it the DIA cycle. Um, Norman talks about the human-centered design process, which, by the way, is an addition that he only put into this book, um, what, like two, three years ago when he released the, the new version of it. Um, before that, he didn't talk about any of that. So it's interesting to see that also there in one of these sort of the Bibles of the HSI community, this idea has made it in there, but fairly late, actually. Um, his idea generation phase is similar to what we call the design uh, phase. His prototyping phase is obviously you know, um, equivalent to our um, implementation phase. And then the testing and observation um, are our analysis phase. So it's basically the DIA cycle with some um, other names. But it's the same philosophy, right? The user is put at the center of your design process. Um, and this human-centered design process is actually a part of a, a broader concept um, that people call design thinking. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about design thinking because that's also become a very um, sort of fancy term recently. Uh, but it really only recaptures and, and expresses the ideas um, that we've been teaching in this class for 15 years. Um, so 
Norman in his book says one of the things that, that I like a lot. Um, he says, uh, one of my rules in consulting is simple. Never solve the problem I'm asked to solve. That sounds like a crappy consultant, right? You hire him, pay him a lot of money, and then he doesn't actually answer the problem or solve the problem you give him. Uh, but the point is that uh, he uses what's called root cause analysis. So he uses a process in which he um, doesn't actually solve the problem that is put before him because he knows that this problem is really just a symptom, if you like, um, of a deeper root cause that is causing that issue. Um, so in the real world, problems aren't put in front of you. They don't you know, announce themselves. They are usually things that need to be discovered. Um, and here's something that we, as, as mostly a more like technical um, sort of you know, uh, study program, are, are not good at. Because usually, if you tell an engineer, here's my problem, um, the engineer will be like, all right, I got an idea how to fix this. And I'll you know, write some code. I'll build a system to fix it. Um, and we are not trained, usually, in, in our um, CS education here to go ahead and say, well, that's great, but are you sure that that's actually the problem that we need to address? Or is there maybe a deeper underlying issue that we should really work on and improve? Um, so we tend to rush to solve a given problem without really questioning whether it's actually the, the problem that needs to be fixed or whether there's something um, you know, more uh, at the root of the problem that we need to address. Um, so you could say, put simple, uh, engineers are trained to solve problems. Designers are trained to find problems. And uh, I'll try to introduce you a little more into that second um, way of thinking, of finding problems, and, and keep it, you know, to keep asking until you actually get there. So you're kind of in like a Sherlock mode um, where you try to really find out what's actually going on, you investigate. Um, and so you sort of you know, don't just stop at the first problem you get pr proposed, but you actually keep digging. Um, and so this root cause analysis is basically a pro process where you say, if somebody, you know, if, you, if, you're pro if you're confronted with a problem, uh, then you keep asking you know, what is the cause of this one, and you keep digging until you get to a point um, where you find the root problem. Um, this, by the way, needs to happen early. Right? If you do this very late in the process, then uh, you know, in the end you discover, oh, we wrote the system to address this issue, but actually uh, it would have been much more important to, to address a more underlying process problem here in the, in the, in the company rather than just write this you know, piece of software that, fix, that, that addresses this one symptom of the issue. So it becomes very expensive if you do this root cause analysis late. Um, so to give you an example, um, you know, you do root cause analysis too, right? If you come to a washing machine and um, the washing machine is sort of, you know, uh, not working, then you're not going to say, "Oh, no problem. I'll just, uh, I don't know, get a new cable and run a new mains outlet into the washing machine and power it up." Now you'll probably check, well, what's going on? Is the plug plugged in at the back? Is maybe, you know, did the fuse blow? So you're going to you continue to investigate until you find the actual issue of what's going on. And that's the same thing that you want to maybe doing um, in these design processes. So um, I'd like you guys to try a first design exercise here in class. Um, so you can take a daily problem that people face. You face yourself, maybe. Um, so do this in teams of two um, and get out a piece of paper to write down some things. Um, and I'd like you to uh, go ahead, take one of those daily problems, and then think about the root cause <coughs> of that problem, what's really going on. Um, so to give you an example, um, if you say uh, somebody comes to you and says, I need a, uh, I need an, uh, um, I don't wake, I need to, you know, I have trouble waking up early. Um, <laughs> You know, make me an alarm clock that is really loud, okay? So, yes, you could build an alarm clock that makes a hell of a lot of noise, but you could also say, well, what's actually the problem here? It's, well, people, this person has trouble waking up early, so maybe we can find a way to instead improve their sleep, right? And then they would actually be rested in the morning and wouldn't have trouble hearing the alarm clock and, and uh, go ahead and, and get up. 
Or maybe you discover things like, you know, teenagers who read the other day actually have a significant problem getting up early in the morning because their time, sort of the biological clocks get messed up during uh, those years. And so then you say, well, actually, we need to maybe shift the daily routine to a later hour um, to address that. So not just solving the problem that's put in front of you, but looking at the root cause of it. Um, you could also say, um, oh, here's a computer design, you know, like the back of the computer, and we have all these different cables, um, you know, USB and uh, FireWire and whatever, Thunderbolt, uh, USB 2, USB 3. Um, it's really hard to tell these apart. So you could say, well, I could give the ports on your computer different colors and give the you know, plugs different colors, and that's been done uh, in the PC world. But you could also say, well, is that actually the root problem? Or would it be much easier if we just had a single cable type that carries all these different data types and you just plug it in and it works for whatever you need? Right? Um, so think about these different issues and uh, see if you can find a daily problem and take a step and try to look behind the uh, superficial problem and find a root cause. Uh, we'll give you guys a couple of minutes to think about one of those. OK, let's hear some examples. Um, anybody got a daily problem and uh, an example of a root cause analysis for it? Yes, you guys. What do you find? I find uh, it's an, an example, but it's not a daily problem. It's a story about a man and uh, his car. Uh, it was in Jack, and uh, every weekend he uh, went, uh, he Every weekend he drives to the supermarket and uh, buys uh, ice cream there. And every time he uh, chooses uh, uh, vanilla ice cream, his car, uh, uh, he, his car is uh, broken. He uh, cannot return home. And every time uh, he buys uh, any, any other type of ice cream, his car uh, is OK and uh, no problems. And, um, the engineers, uh, they decided to uh, search what was the problem because uh, from the first uh, view uh, it seems to be like uh, it depends on the type of ice cream he buys. But uh, then uh, they found the solution that the problem was uh, in the location of the ice cream. And uh, as uh, vanilla ice cream was the most popular, <coughs> It was located uh, near the by the entrance, and that's why uh, customers can. Uh, it's uh, it takes you less time to buy vanilla ice cream, and uh, if you want uh, any other type of ice cream, it takes you more time because it's located in the center of the supermarket. And uh, the problem was that the engine of his car. Uh, <coughs> It was uh, when he uh, bought vanilla ice cream, it was still hot and uh, it uh, caused some problems with the engine and that's why he couldn't uh, uh, start his car again. And uh, okay. when he bought uh, any other type of ice cream, uh, his engine uh, <coughs> was uh, uh, cool enough to uh, start and that's why... Okay. Okay, I see. Uh, great story. I love the ice cream uh, twist on it. Um, so, in a, in a way, the um, th that would be an example where you first think you've identified the pr the the cause of the problem that the car has, but then in, obviously that it would depend on the ice cream part, uh, taste is kind of ridiculous. Um, but it's an example of if you dig deeper, you find a non-obvious reason that could lead you to that false conclusion. You find a more technical reason. Um, why one is colder than the other and why that causes issues and the other one doesn't. Okay, good. Um, another example. Yes? Uh, many people who are um, programming or who are typing novels or something, they get uh, uh, their, their hands get hurt and uh, this pain does go away sometimes, sometimes it does. But um, it would be really easy to prevent this if they had enough, if they would do enough breaks or if they would uh, use different uh, devices, like a different economic mouse. And this is a problem, and, and it happens to many people. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, well, we weren't sure what the root cause is. We weren't, um, but I, I thought that maybe the, the root cause for this problem would be an empathy gap. 
as long as your hands don't hurt, you don't, you don't think about the future in which your ha hands could be uh, hurt and mm -hmm. could be in pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and if uh, you could also say the, the root cause of this is, is not that people are not taking enough breaks while typing on the keyboard, but maybe uh, the root cause is that they're typing at all. Maybe the, uh, uh, the, the next step would be, well, why don't we try to avoid the whole modality of typing and just give you a really good voice recognition, something like this. Um, okay, good. Or maybe there is, you know, if people are typing something up for a, I don't know, let's say they're doing this for their job, you say, well, do you actually need to produce all that written text or could we do what you're doing and by writing all this stuff, could we instead discuss this in a, in a, in a, in a meeting? and somebody else takes some notes. So you basically get rid of the task, um, the particular task, rather than trying to make the task easier. Um, another example, maybe? Come on. One more. Yes? When uh, someone is feeling sleepy in the afternoon, maybe the uh, first solution to think about is, OK, I'm with coffee. But uh, maybe the root uh, cause is that you don't go to sleep uh, early in the afternoon or you want you to accept it or something like that. <laughs> yeah, so coffee as the ultimate solution to being uh, sleepy is, is definitely not quite the root cause analysis yet, I agree. So it's usually one step further you could go to actually address that issue. Great, great. Um, all right, so... <clears throat> Uh, what Norman then also has in his, in his book, as you'll see, is um, the, what's called the double diamond model of design. Uh, so um, this is a, a, an expression of this, this iterative process um, that means that you basically, as you start with a problem, you try to actually find out through root cause analysis, are we at the right problem or not? So you, you know, if you think about time this way, you develop more and more alternative root causes for the issue that is at hand. So you try to understand the problem and try to find out whether that's actually the right problem or whether you should address a different problem. Um, to give you another example, um, if you're, there, there's a, I think this is in the, um, in the video, right? The, uh, the objectified video that we watched. Um, uh, the example for for tooth uh, toothbrush design, um, where you know you say like, okay we can try to design a better toothbrush, but maybe we should think about the whole you know, process of cleaning your teeth. Can we find other ways of addressing that, or like healthier foods and stuff like this that don't uh, attack your teeth as much? So you try to find the right problem here, so you broaden your horizon, and then you focus on to until you think you found uh, the one that you want to address, and then again for solution development with brainstorming, etc and ideation processes, you develop lots of different solutions, and then you drill down on these again until you actually get to, a, um, to the right uh, solution that you then deliver. And you know, this obviously happens in iterations um, and uh, is, is, a, is a model that the British Design Council, for example, uh, also proposes. Now, I mentioned the word design thinking, and um, if you go online, you'll find lots of things about design thinking. It's a, it's a very, very... Um, powerful model of going through a design process for a user interface, but it can also be applied to other things, such as improving the, I don't know, processes in a, in a, in a city government, you know, in a, you know how, how people are, uh, how, how citizens are being um, handled, how other uh, requests are being handled. So you can use it for improving processes in uh, workflows, etc. But it's often, most often used, and it originates from you know, classic product design and, and interaction design. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.